Hello everyone, my name is Lawrence Chuno. Welcome to Doing Art episode 15. This episode is with scenic designer Bryce Cutler. Bryce is a very prolific scenic and set designer based here in New York City. He's worked on well-known shows uh, on Broadway and the one I can still remember is Jesus Christ Superstar, but there are a lot of them. Uh, if you've ever wondered what goes into set design of uh, plays, TV shows, and movies, this episode is for you. I really enjoyed it, and you'll see why. In addition to being forthcoming and personable, Bryce is very detailed-oriented and anal analytical, and uh, I really like that. Uh, you can learn more about, about Bryce Cutler by going to the website of the podcast, doingart.net. All right, ladies and gentlemen, without further ado, I present Bryce Cutler in your face. <laughs> Okay, so we are rolling. Okay. Bryce Cutler, welcome to Doing Art. Thank you for having me. Great. Um, maybe we should just delve right into it. Yeah. Um, let's start from where are you from originally? Uh, I am from West Palm Beach, Florida. Oh, okay. Um, a little retirement community called Tequesta. Uh -huh. um, Tequesta. Yeah. Hmm. It's, a, it's just full of, full of old people, honestly. <laughs> <laughs> um, but yeah, I'm from Florida. Uh, I went to an arts middle school mm. and high school down there mm. um, and uh, ended up in Pittsburgh, going to Carnegie Mellon, and mm. then uh, ended up here in New York. Oh, interesting. So uh, arts middle school, you don't hear that a lot. Mm -hmm. Like I I didn't grow up in this country. Mm -hmm. I keep, I always mention that in this podcast so that people, <laughs> people won't get freaked out by it. First of all, my accent. <laughs> Second of all, maybe certain things, certain questions I might ask. But uh, I learned about arts middle school mm. or high school mm. when I moved to the U.S. I didn't know that you're even allowed to go to school, to high school mm. or middle school just for the arts. You know, um, I know that you could do it. I knew that you could do it for uh, in, in college mm. or beyond. But how did that come about and why why did you oh how did your parents even let you do that well That's, this is a nigerian question it, <laughs> why would your parents let you do do that why not go and do science so that you become a doctor <laughs> um hey I, I do love science okay. uh and uh, um i originally wanted to go to the school because they had they showed us a video in elementary school okay. of like you can you know here are these different programs you can go to because at the time florida mm -hmm. um under jeb bush and these sort of uh people were sort of uh changing education where they wanted everybody to focus in oh, okay. um so in florida even in a high school you still have to, or I don't know if you currently have to, but when mm -hmm. I was attending, um, almost everybody in the state had to pick a major of sorts. Mm. Um, so there was the arts high school. My local high school had um, a medical program that my brother did. You could do mm. a computer science program that my brother did. Wow. Um, so basically, you just sort of like hone in your electives along with your uh, other classes, your sort of mm -hmm. like core curriculum. Mm -hmm. um, but I wanted to go to this arts middle school because they had fencing. Mm -hmm. And I thought that was the coolest thing. I'm one of three boys. So mm -hmm. we always were sword fighting and mm -hmm. like wrestling and, and just probably beating the crap out of each other a little mm -hmm. too much. And, mm -hmm. um, but they had fencing. And so I said, okay, I'll go. I'll try and get in for communications and I'll do theater as a backup. Mm -hmm. And I ended up getting accepted to theater. Hmm. And I imagined myself that I was going to be this like big actor and it was going to be, you know, all, all those things that sort of like starts when like yeah. people sort of discover uh, theater and kind of the arts mm -hmm. and all that sort of stuff. Um, in sixth grade, my teacher was like, maybe you're not really a good actor. Maybe you <laughs> should. I mean, it were in different words, but, yeah. uh, you know, maybe you should do set design. Um, and so in sixth grade, I did a like local competition, yeah. um, and sort of just fell in love with it and, wow. um, have sort of been doing it since. And, mm -hmm. um, the arts middle school led to the arts high school. Mm -hmm. Um, and there they set up a set design program and I had some fantastic teachers and mentors, um, who sort of 
developed, I guess, what, what I do currently now. Mm -hmm. Um, but I, I mean, it's, it's sort of sad, I guess, as you look now and Mm -hmm. I've seen the schools where I've gone have, um, not that they've gone downhill, but just as an arts education, it's not that important Mm -hmm. anymore. Um, you've got the County back in West Palm that are sort of trying to shut down these schools, Mm -hmm. um, because they can hold so many people, but because it's yeah. a magnet school, they only yeah. want to accept you know X amount per class. I see. Um, when capacity could be much fuller and stuff mm-hmm. like that. Um, but I mean, it's an arts. It, it I know it's affected me um, positively that mm-hmm. I wouldn't be here without that sort of mm-hmm. education and foundation. Mm-hmm. Um, do you think? Do you think um, that going into set design mm-hmm. is one of the reasons why you just could say what you said now that if not for for the arts that you wouldn't be here you sound like you're happy with what you're doing yeah uh that's a good question yeah <laughs> <Just> like <laughs> i don't know if i am happy actually um i mean it definitely had an effect on me that i can trace back and like i know that if i didn't have that teacher to sort of push me and be like well why don't you try this or mm-hmm. you know a whole different section of theater mm-hmm. um because everybody at the time wanted to be a an actor. An actor. And even That's going through question. high school and sort of you even get into college too yeah. where you meet people that are in these programs but they still want to be an actor mm-hmm. even though they're becoming a stage manager or something more back behind the scenes mm-hmm. or backstage and stuff like that. Um, but I think, yeah, I think I'm happy that I found what I enjoy mm-hmm. doing. Um, so early. Yeah. And I think that sort of has that really... Is- that's the key. Been to my, yeah, sort of been to my gain and sort of to my benefit in a way. Mm-hmm. Um, because I, I don't know, I, I can like nerd out about all this stuff, mm-hmm. but I would like draw little platforms and yeah. little things and just like learning about all that sort of just opened up a whole new world mm-hmm. of knowledge that I didn't even know was there. Hmm. Um, let's, yeah. Let's go back to your family. You mentioned yes. you have um, two siblings, I yeah. guess. Okay. Are you the youngest or? I'm the oldest. You're the oldest. That's So I feel okay. like part of that too, um, I've got two younger brothers yeah. uh, and they're both in college right now, back in okay. Florida. Um, and being the oldest, I think there's always this expectation to like drive everything. I was sort of like the test child mm-hmm. in a way. I'm sure my parents would like disagree with that. But, <laughs> um, you know, there was just sort of like this kind of push to do, to be the best, not be the best, but yeah. like do the best that I could. Of course. Um, and so with that uh, trying, I think with set design sort of finding was like, here's a thing that I could do and excel at. Mm-hmm. Um sort of satisfy mm-hmm. kind of all the sort of pieces at the same time as enjoying myself. Hmm. Um, wow. Yeah. And my parents were really into theater. Okay. Um, that, which that, I think is like the other question, that it was like, cause I'm still trying to figure out why, uh, how they let you do it because you seem like just talking with you for mm-hmm. this few moments, I, it just seemed like you chose the right thing and you seem like you had a very supportive environment that helped you not sure that so i'm realizing that your parents yeah i think they went they, in the, into theater yeah they um my dad uh travels all the time up to new york um okay. for work oh. um and so when i when i was in middle school and stuff like that he would mm-hmm. take me on these trips where he'd come up for three days to sign contracts and things like that mm-hmm. um and then these people that he was doing deals with would like give us tickets to Aida oh. or to these kind of like big musicals at the time. Mm-hmm. And we went, we mm-hmm. saw all these shows and it was just like, it was probably too nice. Cause there were mm-hmm. like, we sat in the front row for Aida and it was like, mm-hmm. Whoa, this is what this could be. And I think my dad yeah. was just as excited about it all. And yeah. like the grandness and the spectacle of it. Wow. Um, and yeah, I think they were very supportive when they okay. sort of knew that I wasn't going to be an actor (laughs) (laughs) and could do something maybe more concrete that they understood um, with architecture and sort of those construction and things like that. Um, What are your brothers in school for? What? What are your brothers in school for? Uh, One is studying um, like uh, white collar crime, um, sort of like... uh, like, uh, Forensics? No. Mm -hmm. um, I'm trying to think of how to describe it. Uh, like crime with um, people shifting money around oh. with through banks and sort of what's, like I'm I'm kind of pretty sure that that's not what the major is called. Like, uh, it, is the major called white collar crime? No, but I, that's like the best <laughs> okay, way. Like, okay. there's a TV show white collar, like, oh, okay. and he's like basically um, studying. So he's like looking okay. at uh, 
economics and okay. sort of business Maybe and accounting learning forensics. how to like find I yeah so accounting okay. for yeah okay. that's probably the best okay. way to put it i see I um see. and then my other brother uh is um getting a degree in economics right oh, now nice um so he's yeah he's i mean mm-hmm. they're both math based my parents are both um math based uh and they do a lot of business and nice. sort of my mom's a cpa oh. um so with numbers awesome. and all that kind of stuff and so yeah. they Wait. i think easily that's some money that kind of carry. <laughs> yeah <exactly. laughs> that's cool yeah so let's let's go into uh um se- you study set design mm-hmm. or scenic yeah. scenic design scenic, yeah yeah you're the first person who does first design mm-hmm. it's, uh, that I know. Mm-hmm. So I'm really excited about being able to talk to you about that, it. Yeah. So I don't know where to begin. So you went to CMU for that. I went to CMU for set design and uh, projection design. Oh, okay. Um, and uh, I guess set design is in my, from my end of things is a, um, a dressing of the space in mm-hmm. some sense mm-hmm. for a show or a film mm-hmm. um, or concert and things yeah. like that. Anything that would need some sort of background design. Mm-hmm. Um, and I went to Carnegie Mellon for that. Spent mm-hmm. four years in Great Pittsburgh, mm-hmm. um, sort of studying, and then I came here and now. Work. So in in CMU, would that because. Like I learned from Trevor that CMU mm. was uh, for actors. Yes. At least it's a conservatory. Mm-hmm. So would that would studying set design at CMU also be considered like a conservatory training? Yeah. Huh. So sort of um, from with Trevor, um, yeah. what he's doing is sort of the on stage work, mm-hmm. uh, and then all the backstage work is also done uh, at Carnegie Mellon. So mm. when they mount these shows, there's people designing it. There's yeah. students building the sets. <laughs> Um, everything is essential. Every ninety nine percent is mm-hmm. student created, uh, machined, built, engineered, yeah. um, tested, um, and it's all through the process of sort of working through towards that performance where the actors come in and sort of play the parts. Mm-hmm. Um, but there's, I think, people don't realize. Um, that you will do a whole year of pre-planning for a show before the actor ever sets foot into the mm-hmm. rehearsal room. Um, that there's all this prep that goes in, mm-hmm. and not only um, with the scenic design, but in costumes and making sure mm-hmm. the right shoes and stuff like that. And so as you sort of develop these things, um, you know, choices are made even before an actor gets in the room. Mm-hmm. So what they're gonna, the actor is going to wear regardless of who the actor is mm-hmm. um, and stuff like that. So in a way, um, you know, we're adding a piece, whether as a design team, sort of all these different pieces together and the actor kind of like completes it mm-hmm. um, is how I like to think about it. Mm-hmm. Um, but a lot of times just choices are made way in advance. Mm-hmm. So you end up with. Hmm. Um, well, now uh, it's making me think. Maybe we should <laughs> drink our wine. Have the glass. A sip. Mm-hmm. Now, it's making me wonder about a, a few things. Because mm-hmm. I know, like, uh, in conservatory training, they just focus for actors mm-hmm. and maybe dancers, at least, I know. They focus on what the person is there to do. Mm-hmm. They don't bother the person with or the student with um taking maybe general electives and stuff mm-hmm. like that but how how is this possible with uh with set design since you mm-hmm. guys it, set design could involve anything you have to yeah. be uh, like an engineer could do could help mm-hmm. with being a self a set designer somebody who is good with math yeah somebody who is good with uh cooking and stuff mm-hmm. like that so how does a set designer acquire all those ingredients mm-hmm. you know all those skills that helps to become a good set designer in in a school like cmu mm-hmm. that gives a conservatory training well i think what cmu did that was really good um for set design specifically is that mm-hmm. uh as an undergrad designer or um tech track they call it mm-hmm. um you take three semesters doing all the design things. So you Mm. learn how to sew, you learn how to um, weld, how to build something, how to paint, how to um, sort of understanding what everybody does, Mm -hmm. regardless of whether you're the designer or you're the the person all the way at the bottom. So you sort of get like a good idea of kind of all the levels that um, operate and how many people it takes to do something as simple as um, painting a a set or painting something that it's not just like, uh, get up and go. So you spend the first few semesters doing that. Um, 
you learn drafting, model making. Wow. Um, so in the same way sort of architects do, we spend a lot of our time uh, in skill-based kind mm-hmm. of classes. Um, not only, you know, drafting strange objects so other people can build them, mm-hmm. um, building little paper models of things to be mm-hmm. like, this is uh, an idea that I have. You know, how can I visualize it without building the giant thing on mm-hmm. stage? Um So it's half skill and then sort of the other half I think that was really great about uh, Carnegie Mellon is that they sort of push everybody um, to think differently. Mm -hmm. That it's not about, um, I think a lot of theater education is sort of, you know, here's the scripts, Mm -hmm. here's a living room, it says a living room, it says the couch is red, here's the red couch in the living room. Mm -hmm. Um, And I think what was great about Carnegie Mellon is Carnegie Mellon sort of said, okay, yes to all those things, the living room, the red couch, but what if, you know, it's upside down or what if it's, you know, let's think about it in a different way. Like what's Mm -hmm. the point of the couch being red? Mm -hmm. And then how do we devolve that idea further or evolve that idea further Mm -hmm. into maybe the whole space is red, Mm -hmm. maybe in sort of, sort of, um, learning to think creatively, I guess, Mm -hmm. is really the root of it. And knowing, uh, when you read a script, what the intention is and why things are there, Mm -hmm. um, and how design can sort of aid those things. Mm -hmm. Um, but I think, a lot of the learning sort of just comes on the spot from doing jobs and things. Yeah. Um, I spent a lot of my time, sort of 50% of my time doing assistant and associate work for other designers mm-hmm. um, who are well beyond me in their careers. Mm-hmm. Um, but it's a great opportunity because you learn, because I'm not, I wouldn't call myself an engineer, mm-hmm. but I have, mm-hmm. I understand engineering concepts yes. enough to know, um, you know, that this piece of plywood can't hang out mm-hmm. 16 feet without any support or yeah. different, you know, things like that. Um, and so you sort of learn and pick up those things and sort of learn how things are built yeah. um, and things change as you sort of just do it on the job and mm-hmm. you make mistakes and, oh, I see. you know, I see. You never make them again. Yeah, <laughs> that, that, that leads well into my next question. What makes um, a good set designer? Like, oh gosh. Huh? <laughs> That's a hard question. That's a hard question. <laughs> um, well, it's a hard question because I think Obviously, each designer is going to have their own opinions, but yeah. I think a lot of it comes down to style as well and sort oh, okay. of aesthetic in the same way that like a violin player can be very good. But like if you're really into the guitar, mm-hmm. you know, you're not going to see the two as sort of Different. synonymous with each other yeah. or that the vocabulary can yeah. sort of exchange. Mm-hmm. Um, to me, what makes a good set designer is somebody who uh, is willing to take a risk. Mm-hmm. And I think that's what I look for a lot in um set design and in theater and sort of in other artists Mm -hmm. is um, people that are willing to use whatever form they have or medium that they want to use, but are pushing boundaries or pushing limits. Mm -hmm. Um, You know, stuff that really excites me is uh, um, like immersive theater right now Mm -hmm. is I'm really excited by because it's something that's 360 and what's um, immersive immersive theater. So uh, I would describe immersive theater as a, a show or an event or a performance that takes place um, not just on a stage, but maybe it takes place in the audience. Maybe Mm. it's something that you walk through Mm. um, and uh, experience. So Mm. you go to like different rooms. There's like sleep no more right now has sort of become the Mm. the big like staple Mm. um, over in the meat packing district oh, okay. where it's literally two buildings that they knock the walls out from in between. Yeah. And it's five floors of fully mm-hmm. decorated environments mm-hmm. um, that you can go walk through. You wear a mask and there's like people running around. There's people mm-hmm. naked. There's an orgy scene in one room, mm-hmm. but it's all happening within this kind of real time and sort of self discovery method mm-hmm. as opposed to sort of sitting in a theater yeah. and taking in a concert where mm-hmm. everything's prepared. It's sort of up to you to sort of pick your own adventure. I see. My closest experience to that is, um, I mean, I've I've had experience just you describing this. Mm-hmm. I've had a lot of experiences that I would describe as immersive theater. Mm-hmm. Uh, coming from Nigeria, it's mm-hmm. like you go to a show. It's it's usually like you you can't help but participate in it. And one, I don't know if you know Fel, Fela. Fela. Oh yeah, yeah. Mm-hmm. It's like it, it, uh, it's like it's a show. It's mm-hmm. a it's a Broadway show, but at a point in time, they kind of summon the audience to join them in singing no, to join yeah. them in dancing mm-hmm. and stuff like that so would that be that would be considered I would immersive, get to, theater immersive theater. elements okay. maybe yeah. i think like um um maybe like total immersive theaters yeah. where it's like you okay. literally go and you like the ceiling has been I made see. for that purpose yes, or yes. um you know uh Fela sort of has a, a great quality because it comes out into the theater there's mm-hmm. all the walls the kind of pictures and things like yeah. that um 
but I think, and I think you're starting to see a lot of these kind of experimental mm-hmm. immersive shows mm-hmm. that are beginning to bleed out into um, popular commercialism mm-hmm. and stuff like mm-hmm. that. So sort of Broadway shows. Yeah. There's a show coming next year um, that started at a little off Broadway theater and mm-hmm. played on Broadway at a tent that they put up. Mm-hmm. Um, but the whole show takes place in a Russian supper hall. Hmm. So literally uh, they're going to knock out um, not well they're not going to knock out but there's like uh, red curtains everywhere you mm-hmm. sit there's like tables all throughout the audience they serve food you get little maraca shakers and so it's sort of this thing where there's uh, traditional boundaries of the theater or of performance aren't there that they've sort of been wiped away and that mm-hmm. uh, there's rules that you know we don't know yet but you sort of discover as you go over the mm-hmm. co- course of the performance mm-hmm. um but yeah, I, I, I like that work because it's yeah. risk taking. It's yeah. new. It sort of reminds me of Disney a little bit. Yeah. It's kind of like theme park rides. Mm-hmm. Um, with growing up in Florida, I went to Disney all the time, and mm-hmm. I think like that's one of my biggest influences mm-hmm. on my work is because you go there to these theme parks, and they're just fully, you know, covered with. They have their own languages. They have mm-hmm. hidden things. They have triggers. They have, um, you know, their own architecture and vocabulary and mm-hmm. rhetoric. Um, and I think it's just so much fun kind of discovering those things and mm. sharing in those things and mm. making those. Nice, um, nice, nice. Wow. Now, I have, now I'm beginning to have a lot of questions. Yeah. <laughs> but one that I really want, first of all, are you cold? Should I close that window? Uh, I'm good. Okay. I'm just all right. Okay. <laughs> so the one question that just came to my mind is this. When, okay, if you how do how does how does the work begin for mm-hmm. a set designer? Do you see this? The, are you giving the script and said, "Hey, do That's, what you can do"? Yeah. Um. So a lot of times, uh, the script is mm-hmm. found, um, mm-hmm. usually by a director, or sometimes a producer will have the script and say, "I want to do this" mm-hmm. uh, before there's even a director involved. Yeah. Um, and I sort of try to use the script as a foundation. Mm-hmm. Mm -hmm. that's our whether that's a score or a piece of music whatever the script is um Mm -hmm. that's our base and all the answers that we need to know are going to be found in that piece of text or music or writing Mm -hmm. um and then from there i'll sit with a director we'll sort of talk through the show um for hours and hours about the topics and Mm -hmm. the themes and what this means and what it doesn't mean and um sort of what uh his or hers vision is for the show or how they imagine it Mm -hmm. um and then a lot of times the theater itself will come into play and sort of become a, a major point because if um, you're in a black box, yeah. that's going to be a totally different type of design that you can accomplish mm-hmm. as opposed to a sort of Broadway um, proscenium house yeah. where it's sort of one one faces the other whereas mm-hmm. um, or immersive theater where there is no seating mm-hmm. and then you have to figure out pathways. And so there's sort of like these different levels um, or I guess like almost concepts in a sense that have the, their own set of rules as mm-hmm. you begin to break it down and sort of um, filter it out. Yeah. Um, but from there, we'll talk, we'll sit through. I do a lot of um, digital modeling. Mm-hmm. So uh, like Google SketchUp, 3DS Max kind of stuff um, where we will put the whole theater into the computer. Uh, we'll drop in sort of designs and different ideas. Wow. You, you know, here's what it looks like with a piece of glass. Here's what it looks like. Um, where the glasses lights up here's hmm. you know with its wood and all these sort of different um, qualities and tones mm. um, a lot of designers usually make models mm-hmm. um, and I won't usually myself make a model until the the show is locked and we know that this is what, what what's is the budget. model like um, in the same way like architects do models for mm-hmm. um, buildings that they're building or mm-hmm. different things like that um, a lot of times uh just for the team and for the director and kind mm-hmm. of for the um, people you work with, you just build a little quarter inch model. So you're not okay. building like a giant okay. thing, but usually, um, you know, they can range from gigantic, from arm span width, yeah. um, depending on the show you're doing and how big it is, um, all the way down to little quarter inch models that you can, you know, hold in one hand mm. um, and sort of get. But it allows everybody on the team to not only play with little, um, like scale figures and mm-hmm. things like that, but to sort of figure out the show together. Mm-hmm. Um, you can do different light things on it. Um, but it's really just kind of a final way to say like, this is what we're doing, everybody. This is what we want before we increase it, you know, 1200% yeah. and oh, blow it out. Of, yeah. We build the real like, thing. Like a, a small prototype. Kind yeah, of exactly. Thing. Okay. Before we go wow. full scale. Does, does your design, has your, does it ever change? Let's say, has there been a situation where, 
when the show begins, mm -hmm. maybe during the rehearsal, you start noticing that, oh, I have to change certain mm -hmm. things to accommodate this this actor or mm -hmm. these actors or um yeah usually it's it's not as much like this actor can't climb the stair kind of thing <laughs> although i'm sure that happens yeah. um there was the production of the show called august osage county okay. and it had three stories on stage and the woman i don't know how old she was a she's supposed to be the grandmother and they yeah. got a, mm -hmm. an el elderly woman mm -hmm. and she had in the show to run up and down those stairs like every few minutes just oh. and it was i can only imagine how that affected her yeah and, like, must have worn her out but um i've at least i've never had that experience okay. where we've um had to change things because of an actor but a lot of times changes just become uh or happen because they make a discovery in the room or they find mm -hmm. oh we did this great dance move and now we want to um have a place to project it or we want to mm -hmm. do these things so sometimes especially with new work mm -hmm. um things will change or scenes will get reordered so we have to restructure how the design kind of flows mm -hmm. um or things like that but if we know that that's going to happen we try and design in um sort of the ability to change and stuff like that mm -hmm. um but yeah, I guess I've never I've never had like a major change where we like went back to the drawing boards yeah. or anything like that. Because uh -huh. um, a lot of times we once we have that script, we usually focus on what the core idea is mm -hmm. um, and whether that's a line from the show or um, I'm doing this production of Memphis right now in Memphis, actually. Mm -hmm. um, and they describe the space that they're in as a place that's like a cathedral with sin. Mm. Um, that's like there's gin and I forget the exact lyric, but we <laughs> try to make a space that was that this kind of like yeah. large open space that is cathedral like, but sort of um, quickly drops out into kind of a, a gin infused, mm -hmm. al not alcohol, or I guess alcoholics maybe the word, <laughs> um, kind of fun dive bar kind of space. Yeah. So we can switch back and forth as we need, <laughs> um, but always coming back to that sort of line and saying like, does this fit here? Is this with in this kind of world and mm -hmm. what they're describing mm -hmm. um but yeah wow wow hold on i think i'm going to shut this a oh little yeah bit. <laughs> so i was looking at your old looking at your website oh. <laughs> and I saw like your resume is really extensive mm. and you told me earlier that you've only been in New York for maybe getting like to three years. Yeah, almost yeah, three years. Almost three years now. And I mean, I know of actors who have been here for forever mm. who haven't had that that extensive of a resume, mm. but you seem to have worked on almost everything <laughs> you know so how how did that come about like did um, you just get a job right away and you keep getting jobs and stuff i've been very lucky okay and i have to always keep reminding myself that wow. i'm very lucky um i think what i did during school was in the summers i would come here um and intern for people okay um so i tried to find designers um who had interests totally similar to mine designers that were the complete opposite of me mm -hmm. um partially because i figured that that was the time sort of in between school before i got out into the real world that i could like go in and work for somebody that maybe their style or something isn't what i'm really interested in but they mm -hmm. have something that i don't mm -hmm. um and to learn from them and how they sort of um make their work and how they do their art mm -hmm. um and their sort of thoughts so i worked for danielle worley mm -hmm. um who won a tony award for peter and the star catcher and she is a genius mm -hmm. um like there's no other way to put it mm -hmm. um and i think what i learned especially from danielle is that um and these other designers and yeah. people that um there's theory that i think sort of applies sometimes uh in set design mm -hmm. uh and i'm not sure that it's prevalent throughout the rest of the design industry although i'm sure that there are people um but danielle when she approaches her work um kind of realized that there was all this waste that was happening in theater that um because a lot of times these shows go up on broadway you know you spend up to three years sometimes on these shows sometimes mm -hmm. even longer mm -hmm. um and then within 30 days you know the show's gone or is closed yeah. or for whatever reason yeah. you know the economy or this or that um the show just didn't work and so mm -hmm. millions of dollars sometimes is just like it's, thrown away wow. 
And what I really love about Danielle's work is she upcycles a lot of her stuff. So mm. she um, designs the show and then sort of finds the pieces from other things. So when she did uh, Bloody Bloody Andrew Jackson on Broadway, mm -hmm. um, the curtains were like from the producers tour. Mm. So they were, I'm sure like heavily discounted, but they yeah. all, you know, all the stuff that they didn't have to purchase and it's all, and it made it all the more exciting mm. um, within the work itself. Yes, but I think yes. it all comes from like the place of that kind of theory about um, not only just making work, but sort of the process that gets yeah. to work. Mm -hmm. um, and so I, I just had a great opportunity interning for these people and sort of learning. Mm -hmm. So when I came out of school, um, what sort of happened was I just emailed all these people again and was like, Hey, you know, do you need anybody? I'm living in New York now. Mm. Um, did some work for Danielle for a, a bunch of other great designers. Um, and sort of just the kind of connections from that, that, you know, somebody calls this person and says, Hey, you know, I need somebody for a week. Mm -hmm. I go to that person. Okay. Um, I work a lot now, uh, for Clint Ramos and it's, it's, um, mm. but I only got that connection because of Danielle and these other yeah. people that made phone calls and, you know, everybody sort of shares within the community and yeah. kind of wants to help each other out. Would you say there's there is more demand for set designers than than um, than actors, for instance? Um, I think a I think uh, a I think it's there's always going to be like one set designer per show. Oh, and just one. Well, usually oh, at I mean, least one. You can at, yes, least, at least one. one. Yeah, okay. you can like okay. co-design or yes. do a group yeah. design and things like that. But I think in the same way that there's usually like one or two directors mm -hmm. that these sort of um, there's only so many shows, and so mm -hmm. uh, there are fewer set designers I think in New York City than there are okay. actors. Actors, because um, yeah. actors and everybody's are a plethora <laughs> <Yeah>. of actors. <laughs> um, but I think in sort of this, in a way, set designers and other designers yeah. um, on the team they have the ability that they can do multiple shows at once. Mm -hmm. um, whereas oh. an actor can only be in the rehearsal room yeah. and can't, you know, appear somewhere else. So I could be point, during the day in point. rehearsal for one show and then by night teching another one mm -hmm. and then probably in the same night oh. in tech working on the next show yeah. um, as well. So it's um, when you're talking about the resume and stuff, I feel like it's a lot of just like, layering in a sense mm -hmm. um because unlike actors or directors mm -hmm. or even a playwright you sort of have to be in the room there in the moment kind mm -hmm. of exploring it together yeah. whereas by the time an actor steps into the room my hope at least is yeah. that the drawings are in we're in budget you know everything's sort of moving right along mm -hmm. um in terms of construction and stuff like that mm -hmm. um and that things are we're good yeah um nice 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 um the I can I can remember a few things from your website, but the the, <laughs> the main one that catches my attention is uh, Jesus Christ Superstar. Yes, <laughs> <laughs> is is that a memorable experience? Do you want to talk about it? <laughs> uh, yeah. Um, I did a summer stock show. Okay. Uh, with this guy Butch, and Butch was the TD at this theater. What's TD? Um, what? TD. Oh, TD. The uh, TD is the technical director. Okay. So they okay. um, usually collaborate with the set designer to figure yeah. out how these things get built. Mm -hmm. um, partially because sometimes, because like I said, I'm not an engineer. Mm -hmm. And a lot of my work, not that it, I, I like, I enjoy stumping people mm -hmm. who normally build like walls and mm -hmm. these sort of more traditional scenery with like, mm -hmm. well, how do we do that? And mm -hmm. I'm like, okay, well now I feel like I've done my job because like, they're going to get excited by it. We're going to do something cool together and we're yeah. going to solve it together as opposed to just, you know, here's a living room. Yeah. We all know what doors are and how the, you know, that kind of stuff. Mm -hmm. um, but I met this guy, Butch. Butch um, called me a few years later and we did um, and asked me to do projections uh, for a production of Jesus Christ Superstar mm -hmm. up, up in Boston with this theater called Fiddlehead. Hmm. Um and it was sort of last minute. They, they got the phone call two weeks before they opened or three weeks before they opened. Yeah. Um, and we went straight down to Boston. Mm -hmm. uh, they had got a great projector, all the sort of equipment we need. Mm -hmm. And together we sort of um, figured out what the show is. The show uh, had a, uh, um, the idea was to set Jesus Christ Superstar at the base of 9-11. Oh. So that after, so after a destructive kind of moment in a destructive world with uncertainty, um, and so uh, the idea was that as the audience entered the theater, they would watch the sort of pre what was on TV, um, Good Morning America, and those sorts of shows, hmm. um, and then you'd watch the towers fall, and then the show would begin. Hmm. Um, yeah, so we sort of try to use media kind mm -hmm. of in this. Um, uh, 
almost like a um, paparazzi kind of effect yeah. where Jesus kind of his rise came from being a hero mm. um, from kind of 9-11 and emerging kind of saving people. Hmm. Um, so we had live cameras. We had a bunch of fun things that we played with. Yeah. Um, and it was great. It was the biggest stage I've worked on. Hmm. Wow. Um, yeah. The biggest wow. kind of projections we've done. Oh, nice. Um, nice. But yeah. Do you have any, on any other show that, is what talking about <laughs> um As, that's more I, i'm sure all of them is what talking about that <laughs> um <laughs> close to that i really i when i look back on my work i really love spring awakening okay um okay and that was uh, a show that was our my sort of um main stage senior year mm -hmm. um at carnegie mellon which trevor was one of the leads of okay um so trevor we, we've referenced him twice now he's uh, he was a guest on the on the podcast he was i think episode 13 mm -hmm. so keep talking and he's also my roommate, <laughs> he's your roommate. <laughs> <Okay>. <laughs> um in new york everybody has a roommate yeah. so if you're not in new york it's not everybody has a you have to have a roommate to to be able to deal with the rent in, that, in, oh in this yeah. city so um but yeah so with um we went through i think over 40 different versions of what spring awakening was going to be and i think part mm -hmm. of that was because we spent a year of development um before the show we ever started rehearsals mm -hmm. um a year in development yeah huh. um and we sort of I think Spring Awakening is a really hard show because there was the Broadway production mm -hmm. that was done where it was so iconic in a sense. And mm -hmm. I think everybody, um, not everybody, but I think you, when you Google Spring Awakening to see other productions around the country, mm -hmm. they're very similar. They're rooted in angst. They're rooted in kind of um, uh, flashy lights and yeah. rock and roll. And it is all those things. But I think when we sat down um, to make cuisine, uh, directed the production mm -hmm. uh and we sort of said that we wanted it to be more movement based mm -hmm. kind of pina bauschi hmm, um, i don't know <laughs> she's this amazing um uh choreographer but okay. a lot of her work was um sort of she would use set design in a way where they yeah. would have like a field of flowers mm. and so over the course of the dance they would kick up all the fields of flowers so that mm. at the end it was just destroyed flowers everywhere hmm. or um it would snow for the entire time the dance would happen and the snow would just accumulate on the ground. Wow. Um, she just had a, before she passed or after she passed away, they came out with a 3d movie hmm. and it's just so interesting. Her use of space and the kind of way um, her uh, dancers sort of interact within those environments. So we mm -hmm. sort of try to use that as a base um, to say it's almost more expressionistic yeah. than it is kind of rock and roll or angsty or hard edged. Mm -hmm. um, and sort of what we ended up realizing as we went through the process was that Spring Awakening uh, in the music and the text, they talk about how going back to like using the script as our foundation. Yeah. Um, there's all these words of like love and wind and um uh, I can't think about the other words now specifically, but mm -hmm. um, these sort of feelings and emotions and actions that you could feel, but mm -hmm. you couldn't visually grasp them. Mm. Um, you couldn't touch it. You couldn't, uh, you know, love is kind of, I can feel love being passed from one person to the mm -hmm. other, but you can't ever touch. physicalize that. Yeah. Um, and so what we ended up realizing was, well, what if we set it within this kind of void mm -hmm. that these children don't really know their direction of where they're going to yeah. begin with? Um, so literally they were set within a space that we couldn't see, um, you know, the beginning and end of mm -hmm. where the walls were or where any sort of scenery was. Mm -hmm. Um, uh, and everything kind of was came from that. So when we went to the forest scene, we had this big kind of wagon that came down, mm -hmm. um, and rolled down to the front of the stage, but it was filled with trees and grass and all the stuff that would be there, but it was all painted black. Mm -hmm. Um, so we, it was all sprayed so it could disappear into the darkness. Mm -hmm. Um, and the lighting kind of built on that as well. Mm -hmm. Um, and then when we go to the kind of first moments where they discover sex for the first time mm -hmm. um, and their world ignites, yeah. we sort of use that kind of idea of the void and dropped in um, over 2,000 light bulbs on oh, light wow. strings, sort of making this kind of um, almost like an installation art piece. In yeah, a way, this is intense. Where it was, it's, I, I would love it. It was so much fun. And, um, awesome. you know, kind of so that this void, that these darkness, and then we had these balls of kind of glowing light, these bulbs that kind of yeah. grew and everything and almost into a whiteout in a sense. Wow. So it did the opposite once they discover sex for the first time. Oh um, but everything kind of operated on that kind of yeah. um, idea. Mm -hmm. um, mm -hmm. And within oh that, but 
Yeah. And Trevor was a trooper. Trevor oh. in the oh, show he, he was... commits suicide. And, oh, uh, interesting. <laughs> we wanted to kind of him have him move down a level. So he like yeah. shoots himself in the show and he falls backwards into the pit and like disappears into the darkness. And oh you're just God. like, oh man, like <laughs> intensity. <laughs> that's awesome. But yeah, that's, yeah. that's probably my favorite. Yeah. I can, yeah. You're very excited by it. <laughs> wow. Let's switch gears for yeah. a, mi a minute. Let's talk about third space. Mm -hmm. So it's all yours. Third space. Yeah. Um, <laughs> okay. So third space is um, a company that uh, I run with um, Benjamin Vertel mm -hmm. um, and Trevor and our other roommate, this guy, Steven, mm -hmm. um, are sort of um, with us as well, sort yeah. of within this collective that we've made. Mm -hmm. um, and third space, uh, I think started as a reaction to um, the work that Ben and I specifically were seeing in the theater community. Mm -hmm. um, so we, uh, me and uh, my partner, we, we both, um, we assist and we do this other work for other designers. And, um, you know, that's not to say that anything anybody's doing is wrong or, yeah. um, you know, it just wasn't what I think we were interested in specifically. Yeah. Um, we, in my mind, theater is a um, political weapon mm -hmm. in a sense. Um, and that art is a <clears throat> political tool um, to, I mean, it's, it's the, I feel like it's the only one time that people can say anything they want. Mm, and true. that you could just say, oh, well, I'm playing a character now, yes. or I'm, that wasn't me, you know, that's the playwright, <laughs> that's or that's somebody character. else's voice. Yes. And, you know, when it roots back to, it's kind of, it's really a reaction yeah. to everything around us. And mm -hmm. so um, I think a lot of the theater that Ben and I were specifically working on was kind of work that um, wasn't rooted in that kind of idea, mm -hmm. um, that it was about making money or it was about um, a celebrity and sort yeah. of keeping their fame or making, you know, those mm -hmm. sorts of things. Mm -hmm. And I think, um, almost capitalistically, we were like, well, we, we understand the need for this and why it's happening, but mm -hmm. I think we need to go and make our own work mm -hmm. sort of in reaction to, and adding to kind of everything else to show other people that theater doesn't have to be a big Broadway musical that you could have a musical that's little and tiny and it mm -hmm. hits you so much harder than it does, um, mm. you know, a big thousand seat theater and yeah. stuff like that. Yeah. Um, so we organized it. We've done, uh, um, what have we done? We've done uh, a web series that's going to come out um, mm -hmm. in February oh, nice. um, with Alex nice. Spieth. We've uh, did our first main stage um, back in August of mm -hmm. this German play called Fireface. Mm -hmm. um, and I think that was sort of our first really kind of solid production that we've done. Nice. Um, and Fireface was, we spent a year putting the whole thing together. Um, ben had done it at Carnegie Mellon as his directing thesis. Mm -hmm. um, but there were, you know, resources and things that were sort of, um, that he had to follow there. Mm -hmm. um, and so we took the script and the text was just great. And we said, let's do it. Mm -hmm. Let's figure out how we can make it bigger and better. And let's mm -hmm. improve upon the last production. Mm -hmm. Um so we did it in, in August and it, it was a great success. Nice. Um, we had a reviewer who couldn't review the show because it was too scary. Um, <laughs> and wow. our goal wasn't to inspire fear, but I think in my mind that confirms that we're doing something right because, yes. yeah. um, you know, a theater critic who wasn't even prepared for the level of theater that we were making. Yeah. Um, and I think that's really exciting to me and sort of um, yeah. confirms that, what I'm doing mm -hmm. or what we're doing is sort yeah. of in the right direction. Yeah. yeah. Um, and yeah, I mean, if Fireface is like a really dark show, hmm. like the kid kills his mom, he has sex with his sister, kills Whoa. his father. He's Crazy. an arsonist and he's lighting everything on fire. Yeah. So it does have these kind of things, but I think, um, it does say a lot as well that it is, mm -hmm. it kind of has a political undertone. It's a commentary sort of mm -hmm. in reaction to everything we're seeing. Mm -hmm. Um, politically, you know, town shootings. Yeah. Um, what is a family? I think now is a mm -hmm. really big question yes. in the United States, yep. 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 Um, especially with gay marriage now sort mm -hmm. of being overturned and mm -hmm. people having to grapple with these kind of ideas. Yeah. So um, we were really proud of Fireface and I'm really wow. proud of Fireface. Nice. Um, do, do you see uh, some of your shows being, uh, do you guys intend to uh, maybe run them over again sometime in the future to, i think we would like to, to i think part of them the really hard thing again. about theater in new york is that it costs so much money to produce yeah and um obviously you know broadway shows have millions of dollars yeah. but even there it's hard to get 
things done right or done properly Mm -hmm. um, just because of time, you know, all these sort of things, unions break down into it. And there's all these rules about how things can and cannot be done. Yes. Um, So we ran Fireface for three weeks. Okay. I think we would like to begin um, progressing into shows that run for longer. Okay. But at this point with our kind of structure and kind of the institution we're trying to build, um, it's just too much money to run for, you know, two months or something like that. Or, um, we do three weeks and a lot of smaller theater companies like us do three weeks as well, because that's the sort of time Mm -hmm. uh, to get a reviewer in. Okay. Because a lot of times you're just going to build up based on reviews and yeah. based on sort of audience response as you mm-hmm. build your audience and stuff like that. Oh wow, wow! If you if you ever if you guys ever putting up a show, just let me know. Oh I, yeah, I like most definitely. <laughs> yeah, and I can just put it on the website of of this podcast and and the the Facebook page and all those things. Oh yeah, yeah. we'll have to. I'll send you all the information yeah. for uh, Alex Spies web series called okay. Blank My Life. Oh nice. Um, we've been shooting all the episodes, mm. and uh, they'll come out one episode a week starting in mid February. Okay. Um, right. and it's sort of with a bunch of Carnegie Mellon friends, and I think that's mm-hmm. the other thing about Third Space too, um, that I would highlight. I guess is that uh, we try to make art with our friends. That okay. a lot of times, you know, I think art becomes a job for a lot of people yes. after they've been here and mm-hmm. especially the city kind of takes a toll on people. Oh, yeah. So we were trying to make, it. you know, do art that our friends want to do. We want to support our friends. We mm-hmm. want to provide those resources as best mm-hmm. we can. Um, and so if that means, you know, we put some sort of structure together for a company that gets us grants or different things that mm-hmm. like, I think we wanted to do that to sort of build us and build everybody else around yeah. us as well. Wow. Nice. Um, I think we need to switch gears a little bit mm-hmm. more. <laughs> I mean, I'm really, I just, I have a lot of questions, but I'm beginning to think that maybe there should be a part two for this, maybe sometime <laughs> in the future. Yeah. So I told you about uh, your embarrassing story. Oh, yes. Yeah, this is a segment I call, No, You Didn't. <laughs> it's like, oh my gosh, you did that. No, you didn't. So <laughs> it, it doesn't have to do with what could be mm-hmm. anything. Yeah. Well, the first thing when that came to mind, Mm -hmm. and I think I'm like still a little horrified. I mean, this this is going to sound, it's going to sound, basically we were at PE when I was in elementary school (laughs) Uh (laughs) and this girl was like being eaten by ants and I, she was like, why are these ants biting me? And I was like, cause you're so sweet. (laughs) And literally the entire class turned to me and we're like, you like her, you like, and I was like, no, I'm just, I'm being nice. But like my face went red, and the oh, rest of the day I like couldn't. That was the first how thing. How old were you mind. then? Oh God, I don't know how old was I? kindergarten. Oh, that's. But I like vividly remember, and the rest of the day I like yeah. sat in art class in the back and like made like <laughs> sad paintings. Yeah, and, like, <laughs> that could be very very embarrassing. Then I don't know why. Because I remember. That's the end of the story, right? Yeah, I mean that's yeah. That's it, I like it. Just like I really total like. I like it. I like it. Seriously, I really like it because I've had very short stories like that. Mm-hmm. You know, I there was one that happened to me when I was younger, kind of very similar to mm-hmm. it. But I'm not gonna tell it. But <laughs> I've, the story, I've never told an embarrassing story. But this is one of them, very short, like yours. I was in college. I had this math professor, my first my first math class that I took. I was a math major, but that was the first math class I took mm-hmm. as a freshman. She, when we started, her name was, um, uh, her last name was Ch- Chastain, mm-hmm. Stacy Chastain, you know. It's a good name. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> and then the next semester, she changed, her name changed to Stacy Levine. So... I'm f- coming from Nigeria. I had mm-hmm. only been in, a, in in the U.S. for less than a year then. I, whenever people change their name, we just believe that the person mm-hmm. got married, mm-hmm. and we tell the person, "Hey, congratulations!" <laughs> so I saw her. I went to her office. I said, like, "Hey, congratulations!" I shook her hands, and she was very nice about it. Shook mm-hmm. my hands. I'm like, I saw the name change. Congratulations! She's like, "Oh, thank you." And then, and then later on, I I heard that she got divorced <laughs> <laughs> and return like, oh, congratulations then you're divorced <laughs> <laughs> she never mentioned it throughout my stay at the end she was really sweet to me and really nice so that's that's I my like that. quick embarrassing story yeah <laughs> <laughs> so there's this part of the podcast that i call turn up on mute so mm. we're gonna keep it short 
Um, so let's start with uh, Andy. Okay, so if you like something, mm-hmm. if you have something, you can say anything you want to say about mm-hmm. it. But if you like it, you say turn up. If you don't like it, you say mute. Mm-hmm. All right. All right. Andy Warhol. Uh, turn up. Turn up. Okay. Did you guys have to study anything about him? He was a Carnegie Mellon alumni. Oh, he was. They just okay. discovered um, a floppy disk, I, okay. or like a, I guess a few months ago, mm. uh, full of like old digital paintings he did and stuff okay. like that. Um, no, we didn't have to really study him. I think um, what's what I really like about Andy Warhol though is that he did the like the Campbell soup paintings and things like that, mm. and sort of these like mass where he would do like hundreds of those Mm -hmm. and kind of churn them out. And I think that's something really exciting because um, sort of in my own process, I I do a lot of computer rendering stuff as I was talking about. Mm -hmm. And I really enjoy just going back and you can see every single version Mm -hmm. and how that changes. And I think there's something really exciting about sort of the the Campbell soup can Mm -hmm. as it's sort of adjusting every single time because the print or, you know, the paint itself or these sort of different things that Mm -hmm. kind of impact, um, I think it's it just it's very nice. it's very cool. Okay, next one: plantains, fried fried plantains. You uh, lived in in Washington mute. Heights. Mute. mute. <laughs> <laughs> Which one? That's, because there's a red one. Mm-hmm. That there's the red one and there's the green one. Mm-hmm. So you've never had any of them. I I'm sure I've had it at some point. I'm okay. not a very adventurous eater. Okay, I'm all You're about like, the, the chicken nuggets. Ki- yeah, the, I'm the same kind of person. I just <laughs> I'll eat a burger probably yeah. like all day every mm-hmm. day. Yeah, French yep. fries. <laughs> I'm exactly like that. That's there was a time I discovered McDonald's breakfast, mm-hmm. the McGriddle. Oh yeah, in Pittsburgh. <laughs> in Pittsburgh, back in those days, it's over. Uh, yeah. It's- <laughs> Well, now they serve breakfast all day. Yeah, they serve, but they don't do it. They don't serve the mag- oh, really? They don't serve the magrito. I'm like, bullshit. What, that's not pan- breakfast. That's pancakes not- or something like that. That's all they serve. Yeah, I'm like, if you don't have the magrito, that's not it's breakfast. Not worth it, so yeah. It's not worth it. <laughs> you know. But I remember back in those days, it's the number five. I didn't even know the name. <laughs> <laughs> I didn't even know that it's called magrito. I would just go to the McDonald's and point like, to number five. I want number five. five. <laughs> <laughs> and that was what I ate every morning. <laughs> Yeah. <laughs> All right. How <laughs> about um, <laughs> Bernie Sanders? Oh, I should have worn my Bernie shirt. I wore it Ooh, yesterday. Oh, okay. Um, <laughs> You're feeling yeah, the burn. That's I am, and I and I have to say I wasn't feeling the burn though until like two or three. I love politics. Yeah. I love 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 love. I'm kind okay. of thinking about going back to so, grad school for no, politics. For real? Okay. Yeah. I don't think I want to be a politician, be. but something yeah. in like policy making mm-hmm. or like because mm-hmm. I think what's especially really interesting right now is that. Um, you sort of see these politicians and I feel like some of them could really use an acting lesson because True. all politics is, is really yes. in my mind, just exactly. theater, it's theater where the stakes are real yeah. Yeah. that those people actually could lose, yeah. you yeah. know, and then they don't become president True. or they become president. Yeah. You become to the me, highest job po- in the world. Politics is theater. Oh yeah. Religion is theater. Oh yeah. It's like <laughs> traditional. Ahead. Yeah. yeah. Um, <laughs> no, but it is. And I think, um, You know, partially my interest in politics has only sprung since I've been in New York City, where I sort Mm. of realized the kind of bigger world around me. Yeah. Um, And that, you know, there's just so many people in the city and getting different points of view. I love like a good debate about um, politics and things Mm -hmm. like that. And, Mm -hmm. um, you know, there's something really great, I think. And I think we have to keep reminding ourselves, like, how amazing is it that, like, yes, we can have Bernie Sanders and yes, we can have Donald Trump. Mm -hmm. And, like, they can speak their minds. Like, I may not agree with them, but that's like part of the, democracy at work basically mm-hmm. is that you know we do mm-hmm. have the ability to get mm-hmm. up there and say terrible things yes but yes you know that's his right and that's his ability and everybody should have mm-hmm. that ability and mm-hmm. we can disagree and yeah. you know that we can go from there mm-hmm. um but bernie i think is really exciting hmm. i think bernie is um you know i mean he's an actor in a way but he's not an actor because yes. he feels so authentic um, because he has been championing these things. He has been saying these things. Mm-hmm. Um, whereas I think Hillary Clinton is coming a little slow to the game. Um, and Joe Biden was saying that yesterday, mm-hmm. sort of about that, uh, you know, she hasn't been championing, uh, you know, f- solving the political system or money or mm-hmm. Wall Street um, and these kinds of things. So I'm definitely a turn up on Bernie. Hmm. Um turn up a lot yeah a lot especially now that he's he's beating her he's he's you know i mean there's there's still three there's still lots of time yes lots of time we got nine more months or something i know but Uh, i think it's it's just so exciting to watch somebody who um 
there's when it comes to Bernie Sanders, mm-hmm. and I totally agree with everything, mm-hmm. almost everything you've said. But I think Uh-oh, I'm biased <laughs> because because of because of how I feel. I've always loved Hillary Clinton, mm-hmm. and to be fe- to be sincere, mm-hmm. how I felt when she didn't get the nomination. I just I felt like. I felt like that was her turn, kind of. Mm. Then Obama took it. People were more excited for mm. a black man becoming president than. And uh, to be to be sincere, Obama w- was was the man. He was oh, the, like, like he, yeah, he, he convinced that he is. Like, yeah, <laughs> watching he convinced that everybody. Night, like, yeah, exactly. Yeah. That speech last I mean, you're night. Just like, for instance, you can't. Yeah. 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 And uh, th- unfortunately, they make things very hard for. He, 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 this to me, this is like the m- most difficult. A president has ever had it, yeah. But apart from being, apart from um, uh, being kind of a little bit sympathetic mm-hmm. towards Hillary Clinton because I want her to finally get it. Because maybe if she doesn't get it this time, she might she will never yeah, get it's it. Over. Yeah. yeah. Apart from that, I feel like first of all, I don't know how electable Bernie Sanders will become. If he gets the nomination. Well, Bernie Sanders does beat Donald Trump, Ted Cruz, and Mark Rubio. I know, but who knows? Supremely well in comparison to Hillary. But you can't predict America, though. No, exactly. Okay, because you don't know that the Republican the Republicans could decide to do something. Maybe mm-hmm. pay, pay Trump off. Mm-hmm. Let him just say, okay, I'm not going to run. Here. Yeah. And Rubio, and give it to Rubio. Mm-hmm. And who knows how Rubio we, we mm-hmm. fair, you know? So that's one thing. Meanwhile, I feel like Clinton has a machine in place, almost. Like, she has, like, she has the husband mm-hmm. there. She has... She's, like, set up for the job. She's set up she's for like the job. She's, like, the best suited. Exactly. Like, yeah. She's almost... When you look at the resume, you're she's like, She's well, almost, like, the like most Hillary. qualified mm-hmm. presidential candidate I've ever mm-hmm. seen, you know? And then, from every, every indication, we could see that... Obama is leaning towards supporting Hillary. You think so? I think so. I, I don't believe know. Joe so. Biden. I mean, maybe Joe Biden. I feel like Joe Biden will end up not saying anything. Mm. I think he said everything. He. he you know what will. I think? No. I think. Uh, I don't think Obama is playing this card, but I think that there's a under not an understanding, but I mm-hmm. think that if Hillary becomes president, yeah, she's going to nominate Obama to take over Ruth Bader Ginsburg's Supreme Court justice position. You think so? I, and I think that that's... Why, what makes you think that's like... That's out of nowhere. That's out Tell of nowhere? Me more. No, I think... Um, that's like... I, 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 there's no way I could have imagined that. Well, I think... I think do, Obama, but do you think I Obama want to see it? What? Do you, do you think Obama want to do it? I oh, feel yeah. like Obama would just want to... No, I think no. that's like... I think you can only go up by becoming a Supreme Court justice. Oh. And I think Obama stands for all the right things yeah. and he's somebody who's pragmatic enough yeah. within the, um, you know, he. I think he would make a great Supreme Court justice, honestly. Hmm. But and that I, would tie him down for the rest of his life. Well, but, I mean, he's going to retire after president and, I mean, he'll do things. I'm sure he'll champion gun control specifically and like these yeah, sort of but, bigger... Yeah, but as a Supreme Court uh uh justice you don't do anything but that that's all mm-hmm. you do you are almost not allowed to like maybe if you if like his initiatives mm-hmm. let's say the uh like if he were to take gun control up as yeah his main focus, as, yeah he as be main able to focus, focus on or that. like uh the, the violence in the black community or something mm-hmm. like that or he just wants to do something international mm-hmm. he might not be able to, to focus on that that's what i'm thinking so I mean, I, I guess it would be a conflict of interest, maybe. Mm-hmm. And it's a question of like what he would want to do. Yeah. But in my mind, Ruth Bader Ginsburg is probably going to, in the next presidential, going to mm-hmm. step down. Yeah. And I think um, whoever it is needs to find somebody who is as maybe not strong willed, but somebody mm-hmm. who just can pragmatically solve things. Yeah. And I think in my mind, Obama gave. And obviously, you know, I'm sure there are backroom dealings yeah. and like House of Cards and yes. like all those sorts, you know, Ex- that I don't course, know about. Yeah. But I think in my mind, Obama 
almost as like a, a parting gift mm -hmm. is gave Hillary Clinton the secretary of state position yeah. mm -hmm. to, sh you know, show that they were together, that they were united, yeah. but also to set her up. I mean, mm. there's no other job other than president that she could have had that would sort of like make her like, and even build her resume even more, yeah. I guess. Yeah. And I think almost the return is going to be, um, you know, putting him as a Supreme Court judge. Maybe yeah. I'm probably being like radical and maybe I there's mean, like a play within that or, you who know, knows? I don't know, something. Yeah. A yeah. theoretical kind of idea but yeah. i think that i don't know i just i think obama supposedly he's going to be teaching at columbia i don't i don't want him to come back teaching you don't no oh, he's I, he's taught what he's no he but he's got so much more knowledge now he can so, say so much so more what people students should read i want to learn from the ex you want in the united states <laughs> <laughs> <No>. <laughs> no, he's done that yeah i, I just feel like he should collect all his initiatives together mm -hmm. and find a good way to put them under a foundation mm -hmm. and do like what Clinton is doing, mm -hmm. you know, because um, I, f I feel like, and now I'm going to speak as a, as a black, as oh, a yeah. black person. I still feel like Obama kind of, I don't want to use the word O, mm -hmm. but he kind of, he missed the boat. Yeah. He kind of owes the black community a little bit. Mm hmm. And we're not holding him up to it mm -hmm. for a lot of reasons mm -hmm. because we understand, as black people, we understand that there are certain things that we can't do. There are certain things, there are certain ways we can't speak mm -hmm. in this country. Mm -hmm. And everybody's used to that because, for instance, like the Black Lives Matter movement, he's not vocal, he's not been vocal about it. Mm -hmm. Like the police brutality against black man he's not been too vocal about it mm -hmm. and almost every black person understands that oh what's he gonna do he's mm -hmm. a black man if he says anything they will say oh he's just supporting black people yeah but think about it if judge bush was in office mm -hmm. and the police were killing black people mm -hmm. like the way they are mm -hmm. everybody would be like what's the president doing yeah why? you know everyone yeah. would just keep talking about like katrina if mm -hmm. you remember katrina judge bush i don't know what oh, yeah, judge bush would have done then mm -hmm. <laughs> but everybody was blaming him yeah. so i i feel like in a way obama might be this is just my own coming because of my background no, yeah, yeah. yeah he might he might still have a lot to to tackle mm -hmm. uh, in in the minority community not just black community mm -hmm. minorities and poor people in general well, but i think but it, i guess it but he's you know he's setting up uh health care okay for i feel like for um you know intended for middle class and lower class mm -hmm. kind of people mm -hmm. um that is enormous success right now that's obviously true. there are bugs and things that need to be solved and yeah. figured out but like that's going to come with any major piece of legislation or any mm -hmm. sort of major program mm -hmm. um you know i i I feel like the problem, though, of things like the Black Lives Matters movement, yeah. and the ninety nine percent, you know, Occupy Wall Street, and yeah. these things mm -hmm. are like that. They don't have any, um, or maybe I'm just ill informed, but mm -hmm. they're, you know, yeah, they don't yeah, have any same. sort of solid thing to say. Mm -hmm, like these solid. are the four points that we're working towards. Yes, and I feel like it's hard as a president to take a side on these things or yeah. the Occupy Wall Street or yeah. these other groups and sort of movements I think I feel like that mm -hmm. have been coming out and the energy that's been coming out of the yeah. American people yeah. because they there's no they you know they want Wall Street to be fixed yeah. but like what does that actually mean like how do we you know do that or like if we, you know police brutality and mm -hmm. things like that towards the African American community mm -hmm. is a real everyone we, we, we cannot watch those videos and not feel mm -hmm. upset by them it, true true but true. I think it's how do we break it down? So is it that all police officers wear body cams? Yeah. Who controls those body cams? Mm -hmm. And sort of these larger questions that, you know, disseminate down. But I feel mm -hmm. like if somebody, I feel like it, all these kind of movements are missing a leader mm. at the root of them. Mm -hmm. That I feel like it took so long mm -hmm. for the gay movement in the last, you know, mm -hmm. 10 years, we've got enormous strides, yeah. but I feel like because it lacks a leader that somebody can point to and yeah. say, not mm -hmm. only be responsible, but can say like, here are the six, 10 points that mm -hmm. we're working on. Mm -hmm. You know, here's what we are demanding. Here's mm -hmm. what we need fixed. Yeah. And I feel like those are the things that are missing from these sort true, of true. movements that end up becoming moments in yeah. a way yeah. that Occupy Wall Street is now like, yeah, you know that was yeah. on two thousand six. Yeah. You know, forget them. Yeah, but I, you know, I agree with everything you said, but I still, I kind of feel like all those movements they are kind of inspired. They're born out of emotions, mm -hmm. and emotions are hardly ever formed. They hardly ever 
rational mm-hmm. <laughs> you know <laughs> they're hardly ever concrete and well presented mm-hmm. so i just feel like as the movement progresses mm-hmm. they begin to find their voices but oh yeah yeah it might be it all takes time yeah yeah that's but i feel like it's hard for a president to respond to respond to but, a but, to a movement and say i, I agree with I this totally without I, it yeah i'm not even saying he should say anything about the black lives matter matter movement mm-hmm. but i feel like if I feel like if a uh, if if a Republican mm-hmm. was in in office, it would be a totally different reaction. Yes, from yeah. the, from the liberals, from mm-hmm. we the liberals, would be like, "Whoa, why would this be happening? What's the mm-hmm. president saying?" But this time, nobody's saying anything about Obama. Yeah. <laughs> that, 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 that's, that's just my point. No, yeah. yeah, but what what about Bernie? Where does Bernie Bernie w- w- where he stands in gun control, though? Yes, because you remember this what is the, the only thing that people can hit him on, though. Which I think is like really. I mean, I'm sure there are lots of places There's that people could take digs. Yeah, but, but now, I feel like this is Hillary's only real point of attack. That's what you might think. Mm-hmm. So because Obama is grad is Obama just said it fervently that he would not support anybody mm-hmm. that is not in favor of um, just his, basic yeah yeah gun gun laws exactly guns, yeah. And Bernie has has always been against all mm-hmm. this. so. Well, I think, I don't know specifically much about Bernie's yeah. voting record, but my understanding of the situation is that he voted for his constituents. Yes. That he in, um, you know, up north, there's a very different reaction to guns than we have in Florida, mm-hmm. very different reaction to guns than we have in New York, mm-hmm. you know, in Texas, you know, these sorts of places. And I think he, or at least he said that he's reacting to his constituents. So he's but doing how the best right, for them. How right is that? Because that's what that's what all the Republicans do. They vote for their the constituents. Well, I think I don't, they say they vote for their constituents, but really they're voting for who gives them, who the, gives most them money. the most money. Okay. And I you feel like that's point. the difference is that I feel like point. Bernie stands point. for all these things. And I'm yeah. sure on a national level, Bernie's obviously, you know, is not going to disagree with the proposals that Obama just put out but, uh, I see. and the, the executive action. Yeah. But I think that's the only thing that Hillary can really hit on yeah. Um, without sort of lying or like, mm-hmm. um, what's that one? I don't know. I can't think of the yeah. word that I want to use, but um, yeah, I don't know. You know why I feel like the women are going to come and, the, and vote for Hillary. Yeah. <laughs> that's, I, I mean, I, I'm excited to see what happens. I think yeah, that with Bernie brings out a, an electorate yeah. that is maybe hasn't voted yet. Uh-huh. Um, that are is a lot of youth and kind of unregistered people. Yeah. Um, and then you look at somebody like Donald Trump, who's bringing people who have never voted. Yeah. Um, to the point where the GOP and Donald Trump are exchanging email lists freely now hmm. because they he's so high in the polls yeah. that they want to give him the ability to like reach out to who they want. Wow. But he's also bringing in all these names of people that have never registered. Uh, not only to vote, but for the, the Republican party mm-hmm. and these sorts of things that, um, you know, they want to share and get those people on both their lists. So yeah. it's kind of a, there's a, I think a, not a movement, but a, a change in America that's happening. Mm-hmm. Um, and mm-hmm. I hope it continues for the better. Yeah. I just, but, I, I just want to see what happens. Even, even Donald Trump as crazy as he is, mm-hmm. I'm really, I'm really happy. I'm, um, I would say I'm excited about his phenomenon because I, oh, yeah. I don't know any other word to use than he's just than the best the Trump- actor yeah he is he's like, just the, he knows how to play that stage up there know, that's like I I when I watch it, he's he entertains me mm-hmm. during those debates he doesn't say anything like, <laughs> he just says like gibberish and you're yeah. like yeah yeah let's that let's yeah. you know if he yells louder yeah. let's he clap even louder and but it's kind of it's, it is performance and i think yeah. that's like it's almost like church it does, you know it's yeah. it going back to yeah, exactly this, um <laughs> you know and i think that there's something i'm writing a um article right now for um this blog called how round mm-hmm. um which is a theater blog about the debate stages okay. and how set design is sort of used um by each network to mm-hmm. not only display their brand mm-hmm. but also to display the type of brand and questions and character you know characters mm-hmm. that they want the presidential nominees to be mm-hmm. um and so i've just been doing a lot of research nice. and study into kind of you know what's more presidential like yeah. a blue carpet yeah. or red carpet yeah um and there was the Republican debate at the Ronald Reagan Museum where they had Air Force One in the mm-hmm, background. Mm-hmm. But to do that, they literally built up scaffolding four stories mm. so that the shot from the camera made it look like almost as if like the airplane is the award they're going to win. Wow. Like whoever debates the yeah. best tonight can win, you know, Air Force One. And like wow. it was all lit in this way. Yeah. And I mean, it's it's 
I, I think that, and I, I don't know. That's really exciting for me. That's it's kind so of crazy cool. when you think that's about so it, cool though. That's like, to learn that. That's the little yeah, details of all these things. Oh, but nice. the impact they have. But Wow. So, turn up for Bernie, okay? Yeah, definitely. <laughs> okay, finally, uh, Kanye West. <laughs> Let's talk about <laughs> Um. I don't know. You know, I, I don't really listen to much music. Really? Yeah. But I've... I've you I I was listening. To, I was uh I had some music when mm-hmm. you when you walked in and oh, you yeah. were like singing to almost all of them. <laughs> <laughs> Just you know, if I mumble enough, then okay. Like, it'll okay. Um, so <laughs> no, I mean, but I of what I I think Kanye has great set design. I will say that. Okay. I think he's got some amazing set designs for his concerts that are oh, okay. really exciting. Okay. Um, and some stuff where there was one that they were like gonna do where it was like all mirrors, but yeah. it was like too complicated for the lighting to handle mm. and stuff like that um i i, I feel him yeah. yeah yeah i mean when he stole that moment from taylor, from swift, taylor swift i was like oh god but that like, ended up helping taylor swift a lot though. i mean yeah it, helped, it propelled her but <laughs> yeah, it's also just like we can all have i know some sort of common deal yeah not, i don't know yeah but that's what what like, the same what i was telling you about artists mm-hmm. like <laughs> well yeah it's it becomes it's i think that's the other I mean, part of what angers me about the yeah. theater industry is just okay. like I, I'm interested in doing the work, and like yes. to me, theater is about asking questions and political questions. Mm-hmm. And, um, you know what theater, what the future could hold or mm-hmm. what it couldn't hold, and I think a lot of times people or the artists who enter the industry in that respect see it as oh well this is going to be my big you know Um, broadway fame or this is going to take me and it's like well why don't if we you know focus on and did the work Mm -hmm. everything else will come from that but we Mm -hmm. have to do really good work to begin with Mm -hmm. and i think true a lot of people think they can just walk in and like it'll happen exactly that's 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 my dilemma between as as a mathematician mm-hmm. and <laughs> as a musician, like when when I work with mathematicians and engineers and scientists, they just have a different kind of approach mm-hmm. to things than the artists. Mm-hmm. It's you're dealing with emotions, you're dealing with with somebody just wanting to get fame out of it. You're dealing yeah. with somebody just flat out asking you how much am I getting paid for mm-hmm. this, you know, and all those things. Yeah. Uh, last, just from your mm-hmm. answer with, uh, from Kanye West, I want, I, I'm thinking of a question now. How does what you're doing, most of your work is for stage now. Mm-hmm. How does it translate to, to movie sets or like TV shows? Is it basically the same thing? Um, I would say that the, so the difference is with theater, yeah. you have an audience mm-hmm. who's going to sit in one spot. Oh. Um, whereas oh. in a movie, you're going to be viewing the entire movie while in in the end, you know, you're going to sit in a movie theater and you're going to watch the screen, mm-hmm. but the screen has the camera ability so that we can I change see. angles, we can yeah. change things. Yeah. So a lot of times with um, film and sort of the film stuff that I've done, it's about... Um, building sort of what the camera sees and doesn't mm-hmm. see. Mm-hmm. So if um, something is super up close, we're going to want it super detailed. And mm-hmm. then something in the back, maybe we can get away with because mm-hmm. it's going to be out of focus. Um, but a lot of times you build as much detail into everything as you can. Um, and you sort of prepare yourself as best you can for whatever angle, you know, you're going to need or, mm-hmm. you know, you, and you have those discussions before to say like, yeah. are we going to have any, you know, upshots? Do we need to worry about a ceiling or can we just build some walls and mm-hmm. sort of enclose everything? Um, mm-hmm. And each one kind of brings its own kind of each project or, you know, location. Yeah. Um, film, I find to be a lot more uh, grounded in realism, mm-hmm. um, which is sort of a lot of my like theatrical work is maybe I want to, I would hope not hope, but like it is kind of far away from realism. I don't really mm-hmm. do like living room sets or okay. um, kind of things that I see in everyday life. Cause I'd I rather see. use the stage as a way to theatricalize kind yeah. of real life. Mm-hmm. Um, whatever that means or whatever the project sort of calls for. Mm-hmm. Um, but in film, it's much more grounded. Yeah. It's much more level headed. Um, and you get paid much better though. Mm-hmm. I do have to say oh, <laughs> like, so much better. Yeah. There's so much money for film and TV. Mm-hmm. And, but I was thinking like, I think a year ago I was watching a bunch of talk shows that were done in the seventies. Mm-hmm. <laughs> and I saw that these talk shows the set is like the whole rooms, like they have everything. Mm-hmm. They have a, re- a refrigerator and everything. That. But today's talk shows, they only have like a couch. Mm-hmm. Like, 
how how is it that things transform like that do 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 you guys discover things as time goes on and be like oh there's no need for this anymore mm-hmm. you know so well, i think <laughs> um you know with talk shows and things like that i think a lot of it was about coming into the home yeah that as tvs have since become bigger yeah. and you know, they just went, there's like a 92 inch television mm-hmm. that they just premiered at CES in mm. Vegas. I mean, 92 inch, that's, that's like, a that's a giant, yeah. you might as well just like do your whole wall yeah. as an LED yeah. panel <laughs> and like call it a TV. <laughs> but I think, um, you know, a lot of design is sort of thinking about that. So yeah. like not only the viewer of like what the camera is going to see, but how mm-hmm. the viewer takes it in. Mm-hmm. Um, and so I think as you start to see kind of styles change you know everybody's on a couch now because everybody sits on their couch to watch tv Mm -hmm. um you know i think like uh talk shows and things i mean i you know it's like you're sitting at dinner across from somebody and you're sharing a table and having a conversation um but i think you're i my guess Mm -hmm. and this is i'm doing a or i don't know what i'm doing (laughs) i have this idea to do uh like a virtual reality kind of show Mm -hmm. um and i think as you start to see these new technologies come out Mm -hmm. um like oculus and things like that um you know how is design going to change then and how is acting even going to change then yeah where you don't have to go to a movie theater anymore you don't have to go to see a concert or a thing you can just literally you know sit in your home put on goggles Mm -hmm. and beam yourself there to the front row Mm. um and still experience it and still feel it and sort of get all those emotions. Yeah. Um, but I think virtual reality is something that's very exciting. Nice. Um, in college, I experimented a lot with like holograms mm-hmm. um, and sort of like digital actors. Mm-hmm. So like what is, um, I guess part of, and this, I feel like actors will hate this, but like what is like a robot and mm-hmm. what is, um, you know, a robot do? Because a lot of times in theaters now people have tracks and sort of a setup. Mm-hmm. Um, and so what is that? If you have a track, why couldn't, let's say, like, I had the ability to make an amazing robot that could, mm-hmm. like, perform and, like, you could feel for things and stuff like that. Mm-hmm. Um, you know, could you wipe out an actor entirely and say, just, you know, you the next robots. production of Mother Courage on Broadway with, uh, you know, Meryl <laughs> Streep in the lead role, but it's really, like, her hologram, hologram. performing. Like, you know, would people go see that yeah, even? Yeah. But I think you, you saw the Tupac, um, yeah, yeah. you know, hologram and things mm-hmm. like that. And there's a whole company that was coming out with all of these holograms that they're going to tour the country as if, you know, yeah. um, Tupac is actually performing a concert yeah. and it's, you know, people, they've made money off of it. Mm-hmm. Um, mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. And I think there's something really exciting about that. Mm. Um, and I think the, yeah, the possibility. So, but then how does design change and yeah. adjust for sort of a new yes. technology or a new viewer and kind I, of the medium in which we view it. Mm-hmm. Um, but yeah. I, nice, nice, nice. Wow. This has been great. There's <laughs> definitely going to be a part two this to one. this. Yeah. <laughs> Bryce Cutler, thank, thank you, you so much. much. Thank, thank you for coming to my show. No, I really appreciate <laughs> yeah. it. Great. We did it. Later. Boom, boom. <laughs> <laughs>
faithless complacency or in a passive life unfulfilled. Hold on to your dream and run with it. Don't put a limit on what you can do. Step over the brink, my friend. From imagination to actualization. Impossible that a dream is impossible.